Okay, well, welcome back again. Here we go. We're now talking about eco design. Um, so let's have a look at that. So, um, first of all, eco design, this is from the, the glossary of terms. So, it's a design strategy that focuses on three broad uh, environmental categories. So, we want materials, energy, and pollution and waste. And of course, the whole idea here is that we're reducing or thinking carefully about the materials that we're using, reducing or thinking carefully about the energy that we're um, using, and then thinking and careful, carefully about the pollution and waste that we're using. Go ahead and watch this video. It, it gives you a, that's about a three minute video and it gives you a good breakdown of what eco design is. Okay, so uh, just like before, we're looking at drivers of eco design. And, and just like with uh, green design, the drivers are basically uh, consumers and consumer groups, and then government legislation. So, for instance, this is a um, a law that the EU passed. It's called Eco Design Directive. You can uh, click on this link and go have a, a quick look at it. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to read it, but it's sometimes nice to just see what these things actually look like in real life. So, if you were to go and actually kind of scroll through this, you'd see what what an actual you know government legislation, actual government law looks like. Um, as, as uh, concerning eco design. Okay, so here's some considerations of eco design. So these considerations, they of course vary with whatever product and, and the market that you're looking at, but essentially what we're trying to do is reduce the creation and use of toxic materials. So, you know, if, if we're finding out that something is toxic or we know that it's toxic, how do we reduce that? A good example of this is uh, BPA. Um, I forget what it stands for, but it's a chemical that they put into plastics that softens them to, or m m harden them. I can't remember if it's a hardener or a softener, but um, it, it also um, is an endocrine disruptor within uh, the human body and that can cause um, issues. So if you, uh, you know, can reduce the use of BPA, good. Okay. Um, how can we increase recyclability? How can we reduce the energy consumption? How can we uh, um, use renewable resources rather than uh, non-renewable resources? And then increase uh, the durability, right? So how can we make sure that the product lasts longer so we don't have to buy new products? And then, you know, what we're doing there is trying to get rid of this planned obsolescence. So planned obsolescence is when a company basically makes it so that the the product becomes obsolete. They plan it to become obsolete. Um, we also want to reduce the material requirements for products and services, so using less materials. Okay, now how do we, there's a time scale for this, so how do we um, manage that? So what is influencing the time scale is, is cost, of course, right? So, you know, eco design is something that we, that's going to cost more. And then what, what are the available technologies that we have? So cost and available technology, because new technology is usually costly. If you are doing a radical or whole system overhaul, it's going to take longer to implement eco design than if you're doing an incremental um, change. And then, you know, eco design is, is by nature more complex. So you have to, you know, sort of think more carefully about how you're going to do something to reduce the energy cost, to reduce the, the material cost, and re reduce the waste that's produced. So it's, it's more complex in its very nature, and therefore more complex things cost more money and take longer. Okay, so these can all add to the time scale. All right, there's some philosophies that we want you to know about eco design. So one is the cradle to grave, and we've talked a little bit about this before. You know, it's the idea that that we consider the environmental effect of a product all the way from the manufacture to disposal. So we're talking from pre-production, so getting the raw materials that you need, to producing it, to transportation, to use, and then finally to disposal. And then we have cradle to cradle. So cradle to cradle is, is similar to cradle to grave, but instead of, you know, disposing of something into a landfill or, you know, basically not using it, it's reusing it and returning it to its, its uh, original form. So it's, a, it's a, a design philosophy that aims to eliminate waste from production. And a good example of this would be, for instance, you know, a glass bottle. You can actually remake, you can recycle the glass bottle and remake the glass bottle so that you don't have to make more glass bottles. You are just simply remaking the ones that you already have. Um, so that's it. It's an example of the idea of great cradle to cradle.
not all products can go through this cradle to cradle thing, but p components of different products can. You know, a car, you can reuse the metal in the car, but you're really not going to remake the same car, like a, you know, a bottle, a glass bottle, you could remake the same glass bottle. You're really not going to remake the same car out of the components. Okay, so cradle to grave, um, we just talked about this. You know, it's just going through the entire manufacturing. It's considering all of the um, environmental effects from, from the production and uh, extraction all the way to disposal. Um, this is a good video that talks about cradle to cradle, so have a look at that, and it gives you a good understanding of what cradle to cradle production might look like. Okay. Life cycle analysis. Now we did one of these uh, on batteries, so we looked at at how complex they can be. There was there was an actual one that I, I put onto the uh, um, the assessment or not the assessment, but the assignment. And if you want to go back and look at that, it was about uh, the different types of batteries, and it's it's complex, you know, and it's like a three four hundred page document. So these things can be very complex and very expensive. But basically, what they do is they analyze the effect the product has on its entire life cycle. So from pre-production all the way through to disposal. This is a, a video from Gore-Tex, which is a company that uh, produces waterproof, high quality waterproof um, clothing. So have a, have a quick look at this and it talks a bit about the, the life cycle analysis that they do. Okay, so life cycle analysis, we want to assess and balance environmental impact with the product's uh, life cycle. Right, so we're, that's the whole thing here is we want to look at its environmental impact and assess and try to balance that. Um, the life cycle analysis highlights areas that um, with opportunities to re reduce uh, environmental impact. So once you know what the environmental impact is, you can go back and kind of say, okay, well, how can we mitigate or change um, this environmental impact? Um, it also makes designers think about changing product designs to introduce um, like greener and more sustainable product design. So it, it's, a, it's a useful tool to help you become aware of, of the impact that your product has and then think about how can you change that to, to make it more sustainable. Okay, so life cycle analysis, it starts with, and we, we looked at this again um, back when we did the life cycle analysis of the battery. So it begins with uh, pre-production. So this is where you're getting your natural resources. And that can have that can be very polluting, like strip mining. Strip mining is when they dig a big hole and, and basically strip off the layers of rock and, and uh, soil that are on top of that, that resource. Or you can have uh, a smaller effect, and this would be like shaft mining. So this is your, your sort of classic mines that you would think about where they dig a, you know, a deep uh, tunnel into a mountain and extract um, natural resources that way. Um, and we'd include in here the transportation of the raw materials to where the, we're processing um, those raw materials. So from from the mine, let's say, into where the smelter is, or you know, if you let's take wood or something like that. You know, if I'm cutting down a tree, so I'm obtaining the tree, and then I need to take that to the the lumber mill where they where it gets sawed into its components uh, into its lumber. Okay, production. So production is is taking those raw materials and making a product, right? So you're processing or making a product, um, and this can damage the environment, you know, because you can have a, a factory spewing out smoke, or it can have water pollution, cause soil pollution, or you know, it can have a small impact. So you know, um, it could be that that you're handcrafting something, and that that's going to have a much smaller impact than a factory that spews out a bunch of toxic um, waste. Okay. Um, distribution. So once we have the product, we need to get it from the factory where it's made to where it's being sold, and then back and then into somebody's house. So this could, you know, we, we're moving um, a product from the factory to the warehouse and to the store, and then you have to also consider the packaging. You know, the packaging is very important, and this can have a, a, a large impact. You know, if you import something from China to, you know, Saudi Arabia that has a, a massive impact. You're taking something from halfway around the world and putting it you know, on the other side of the globe. And that's going to have um, you know, costs in a lot of ways on the environment. So that's something to pay attention. Locally um, produced goods are, are just better for the environment because they're, they have less transportation costs, uh, less distribution costs. Okay, utilization. We have to think about the product's use. 
So how is it used and what, what, what effect does that have on the environment? You know, some things have very little effect and some things have, have a large effect. So, you know, you could take something like a dishwasher. A dishwasher is going to be using water. It's going to be using soap. It's going to be using electricity. So those are all going to have an effect on the environment. Whereas, you know, let's say I have a kitchen knife. That, that doesn't have a huge impact on the environment because, I mean, really the only impact it has is, is probably, you know, that I have to wash it. So there's some energy, embodied energy with the washing of the knife because we have to obtain the water and then, you know, um, deal with the, the wastewater that comes off. But, you know, really that's that's pretty low. And, you know, something that's not getting washed is, you know, I don't know, like a chair or something like that has very little effect on the environment once it's made. Okay, uh, this is an example. You know, a diesel generator will pollute air and make noise, while a solar panel will generate less. You know, you still need to clean a solar panel because they do get dusty, but, uh, you know, that's going to have less of an impact than, say, a diesel generator, which generates electricity using diesel fuel. Okay, disposal. So depending on the product, um, you know, the method of disposal is going to have a bigger or smaller impact on the environment, right? So if I recycle an aluminum can, that's going to have less environmental problems than if I throw one away. Um, biodegradable objects can be reused, recycled, or left to compost or break down. Uh, paper is an example. So paper is, is best recycled, right? Because they use a lot of chemicals to bleach the paper and pull apart the uh, the fibers in the paper in order to make it, you know, the fibers in the wood in order to make the paper. Um, there's also resource extraction, um, you know, but a banana peel, it's pretty much useless. Once you're done with it, it's pretty much useless. You're just going to use that for compost or just throw it in the garbage, right? But there's going to be very little, um, there's going to be much less environmental impact and you, would, you wouldn't recycle banana peels, okay? But you would um, recycle uh, paper. Okay. Now, uh, another way to test the environmental impact of a product is to do one of these environmental impact assessment matrix. And they look something like this. So you would rate things. Um, and then usually what, what it is, is is the higher the number, the less the impact. Um, from what I've read in the textbook and seen, uh, the higher the numbers, the less the impact. So if it's got a very large impact, you're going to put zero. And if it's got a very low impact, you're going to put a five. And then at the end, you'd be looking at the, the highest number would be the one that would be the most environmentally friendly. And again, it goes through the different um, areas. Here's another one right here. Okay. So you would be circling the numbers in a row. Okay. Now, What's the comparison of a, of a life cycle analysis and a matrix? So the life cycle analysis, remember, they're super complex. Go back and look at that 300-page document, very complex, whereas a matrix is quite, quite a bit more simple. Um, the life cycle analysis really focuses on one single product, and we're looking cradle to grave. Um, whereas a uh, matrix might look at a broad product category, you know, it could be, for instance, um, cell phones. So it could be all cell phones because roughly the, the, um, the life cycle analysis, the, the matrix, the environmental matrix uh, for an iPhone is going to be the same for an LG phone. Okay, um, life cycle analysis are very expensive because they're multidisciplinary. You got to pay a lot of people, do a lot of research. They take a lot of time. They're very complex. That equals money. So they're costly. The matrix is quite a bit cheaper because a single person can do it. Okay, and we're even going to talk in the next lesson about uh, some of the products that are out there that actually will do these, these uh, life cycle analysis basically for you because they've got a whole database on materials and, and um, it will automatically calculate those things for you. All right. Well, thank you for watching. We'll see you guys next time.